names stand out in the establishment of the shipping services of the East. They are those of Sir William McKinnon and Robert Mackenzie, who founded the British India Steam Navigation Company in 1856. The McKinnon Mackenzie building is still one of the best known landmarks of the Bombay port area, and it is here that the passengers for the Dwarka come to obtain their tickets. Where in the past its clients would have been British officials, today the travellers are emigrant workers. For them, the McKinnon Mackenzie office is the end of a long trail, the route out of India to new opportunities elsewhere. They have come from Punjab in the north, from Kerala in the south, from Orissa in the east. Many will have arrived at Victoria Terminus, Bombay's great railway station. For Bombay is a gateway between India and the rest of the world. Teeming millions gravitate to this city in search of new means of survival. India's greatest export has always been men. In the British period, a flood of people left for other parts of the empire. They are still leaving. Now the poor, overpopulated third world offers labor to the wealthy, underpopulated fourth world of the oil-rich states of the Arabian Gulf. That is why the last British passenger ship in the east survives. Dwarka carries up to 1,000 migrants to the Gulf on each voyage. She picks up 500 here in Bombay and another 500 in Karachi. Many have spent a lifetime saving securing visas, paying agents, buying their tickets. Some of the migrants will have already paid extortionate sums. There are perhaps more sharks on land than in the sea. Most of the passengers will be away on two-year contracts and will leave their wives and families behind until they have made satisfactory arrangements for their dependents to join them. There are three ways to travel on the Dwarka. You can take a cabin, a berth and a dormitory, or you can travel in the open air on the decks. A pleasant prospect in this climate, so long as there are no unseasonal squalls. I chose a cabin. For Dwarka's passengers, an uncertain future is perhaps lightened by a present sense of adventure. But for family and friends, there is only the sadness of parting. Dwarka sails on one of the oldest shipping routes in the world. The Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula have always been the pivotal point of three muscle of India and Pakistan can be transferred to the oil fields and construction sites of the Gulf. Dwarka's passengers see reminders of the past, dows the traditional Arab vessels which have dominated the shipping of the area for 2,000 years, still make voyages from the Gulf to India and even to East Africa. Apart from Dows, Dwarka is the most economical means of travel, and so, in this climate, the passengers are happy to arrange themselves around Dwarka's decks. Families stake a claim to a piece of deck, and life goes on as normally as possible in this strange new environment.
The ship's master, Captain Henkin, has sailed the Gulf on and off for 30 years and has commanded the Dwarka since 1973. One of Captain Henkin's concerns is the feeding of his passengers. 4,000 chapatis a day are produced here in the bakery. Amazingly, in this oil-rich world, the oven's fuel is coal. The technique is one you could find in any Indian village. There are several galleys for vegetarians and non-vegetarians. In the galley for cabin passengers, all tastes, including Western, are catered for. The chief cook, his galley staff, and all the stewards come from Goa, the ex-Portuguese colony on the Indian mainland. Even on the Arabian Sea, it's chips with everything. The Goanese have a long tradition of service to passengers on British ships and still serve on modern luxury liners. They have names like Ramirez, Da Silva, Oliveira. Mass catering for a thousand passengers is perhaps rendered easier when the preferred food is curries. <laughs> There are several sittings, and the provision of food carries on throughout the day. Some eat below decks, but most prefer the pleasures of eating under cloudless blue skies. Baluchis and Patans from the northwest frontier of Pakistan, whose forebears would have been tribal warriors, have now become migrant workers particularly welcome in the Middle East, since they share the Muslim faith. Dwarka's first landfall in Arabia is a beautiful one. Oman is the gateway to the Gulf, and Muscat, the capital, is set among mountains, islands and fortifications, for this has always been a strategic place. Here, the population once eked an existence on the edge of the desert, by trade and by piracy. Now, as elsewhere in the Gulf, traditional rulers have had to turn themselves into technocratic masters of states whose power and wealth are out of all proportion to their size. Until 1970, Oman had barely entered the 20th century. The speed of modernization has been staggering. The palace of Sultan Qaboos, lying beneath the walls of the great forts of Old Muscat, symbolizes the connection with India. For it was designed by an Indian architect and built by an Indian construction company. Sultan Qaboos has so far ridden the tiger of modernization successfully, but across the Gulf, the Shah has fallen. The rulers of the Gulf states work hard to ensure that this does not herald the sunset of their traditional rule. Dwarka lingers only briefly. She sails again into the night 
setting her course for the Strait of Ormuz, the most strategic channel in the world. Soon she will pass from the Arabian Sea into the Arabian Gulf. Captain Hankin enjoys the challenge of this route so much that he spends more than a year at a time with the Dwarka before returning to his home in England. I did take one month's flying leave in May last year, more for a rest, um, and I wanted to be back before the monsoon started because, hard to say, but I didn't like it in anybody else's hands when the bad weather started. Uh, but um, if the ship continues, I will be here until September or October this year, and I hope she does. You must feel really quite a degree of affection for the old girl. Old oh, girl? <laughs> I'm not sure that I appreciate that phrase. Uh, to me, this is still very much uh, a viable ship and, and, and a beautiful running ship. Not that I have much to do with the running side of it. The engineers have worked their soul cases out down there keeping her going and um, all respects to them very few of them ever say we don't want that ship back again which to me is is uh, is praise enough Dwarka threads her way into the most congested waterways of the Gulf at night the joke on board is that she can now find her own way but for the officer in the lonely watches of the night Navigation and the avoidance of other vessels and oil rigs is no joke. Now his night sky is illuminated by great gas flares that could keep whole towns in energy to the end of the century. <laughs> Dwarka's passengers have... Dwarka, Dwarka, Kuwait Harbour. Yes, Dwarka, Kuwait Harbour. Kuwait Harbour, Dwarka, clear, passing Russell Hard, land Kuwait Harbour. Over. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Over, sir. Shukra. Dwarka sails across the Great Bay of Kuwait. She used to sail on to Basra in Iraq, but Kuwait is now her westernmost port, 1,600 nautical miles from Bombay. Until a few years ago, Dwarka anchored here and landed her passengers by small boat. Now Kuwait has built a fine modern harbour, just one of many prestige projects financed by her massive oil wealth. The migrant workers look out on what is perhaps the most prosperous of all the Gulf states. Certainly, the population here enjoys the highest per capita income in the world. Hopes are high for their futures as part of the Kuwait economy. Years of planning and saving have led to these first few steps onto this new land so different from their own. Ahead lies their first disappointment. Some will be accommodated here. It is not much of an improvement on the dwellings they have left behind in India. They will occupy the poor homes which Kuwait villagers have left.
the original inhabitants have moved on to enjoy their share of the oil wealth elsewhere. Where a few years ago there was only sand and the technology of ancient boat building, a great city has erupted. The city sought a symbol and found it in these extraordinary towers. They are a 20th century folly, elegant monuments to conspicuous expenditure. Everywhere, new buildings soar into the Arabian sky. It has been a paradise for the construction companies, if not for the construction workers. Here, immigrants constitute 53% of the population. The city depends on them, but they are all birds of passage. Of the past, only the Dows survive. Dwarka sails again, eastbound now for Bahrain, Doha, Dubai, Karachi and Bombay. At each port she will be picking up returning migrants, eager perhaps to be reunited with family and friends, but facing too an uncertain future. The senior harbour pilot, like Kuwait itself, mixes old and new, the western uniform of a master mariner and the traditional functional headdress of the desert Arab. Dwarka's engine has been taking migrants home for more than three decades. It is a ten-piston, five-cylinder Doxford diesel. But fires burn in her scotch boilers, and light, refrigerators and winches are all run from auxiliary steam. Far cry from the engine room is the faded gentility of the ship's library. Here the ladies of Indian army officers play gin rummy. Their husbands have been training the Iraqi army in Baghdad and Dwarka is the best means of transferring their homes back to India. The ship maintains a rigid imperial or perhaps oriental class structure. Officers for the cabins, other ranks for the decks. The leisured life of the Dwarka is for the officers' wives nothing new. They represent the other side of India. They are the inheritors of the Raj. They have played cards in a hundred stations, while their husbands carry on the Sandhurst traditions of the Indian army. <laughs> On the decks below, a rather more energetic game passes the time for the labour migrants. 
For them, this is a holiday, an unusual time of leisure between their work in Kuwait and their efforts to re-establish themselves in India. But those who sail from Kuwait have plenty to see on the way. Dwarka calls at a different port each day. Bahrain is the oldest of the oil producing states. Now her oil resources are severely depleted and her economy is running down. But she is becoming the banking and commercial center of the Gulf. She still needs migrants and Dwarka carries the foodstuffs they require. It is a life support system for the expatriate Indians. If nothing else, at least their food will be familiar. India is the provider, not just of people, but also of the spices, the fruit, the tea that the desert cannot produce. Cargoes from Dwarka soon find their way into the souk. In many of the places in the Gulf, these markets have been swept away by modernity. But in Bahrain, the old souk survives, a rabbit warren of shops, stalls and money changers. There are two groups of Indians here, the workers whose stay will be short and the traders who have established their commercial supremacy throughout the area. The most successful trading company in the Gulf presents an international shop window serving an expatriate jet set that stops off here between Europe, the Far East and Australia. Bahrain, after all, is in that select group of Concord destinations. Many of the smaller shops are owned by Indians too. The post office on the edge of the souk is thronged with migrants queuing to send their letters and postal orders back to the people at home. In this way, some of the wealth of the Gulf is transferred to the poverty-stricken subcontinent. Whole villages in India must eagerly await the arrival of packages from breadwinners thousands of miles away. But some of the migrants are sending themselves home. Dwarka's holds fill with their baggage, much of it acquisitions that are tangible proof of their success in the Gulf. From the island of Bahrain, Dwarka continues her progress on an overnight voyage to Dubai. As a passenger ship, she has the right of way over freighters that have been waiting at anchor for weeks to discharge their cargoes. While Bahrain is beginning to show signs of contracting, Dubai is booming. Dubai, like Kuwait, has its symbol. And even more strikingly than Kuwait, mixes old and new. The creek is Dubai's Grand Canal. Here, hundreds of dhows load cargoes transshipped from the modern harbor. The same sacks of spices and chests of tea that Dwarka has brought from India will be transported by traditional vessels all along the coast of the United Arab Emirates. Here, you can hire a dhow to cross to Iran or any of the islands or points on the coast of the Gulf. Dark stories, sir. sails from the most impressive harbor in the Gulf. She passes along the Trucial coast 
before setting her course eastwards. By morning, she will have passed again through the Strait of Ormuz and emerged into the Gulf of Oman. Green-fingered chief officer in the fleet, Bob. But so far as I know, there's been no reports in about ourselves of wavelength about it. <laughs> Any, anybody else doing it? What gave you the idea to do this? It was my wife's idea originally, but I'm trying now to grow enough potatoes to give us all a chip butty before we go home on leave. <laughs> John Sullivan, the third engineer, is very keen uh -huh. to have a fried potato omelette. Haven't you got much confidence in the food on the ship then? Oh, we actually enjoy the food on the ship. <laughs> It's nice to complain about it at times. Have you had a crop yet, or, or is this the first lot? No, I started once before, but they got too hot and they got baked in their jackets inside the tin, I think. <laughs> and they all died away up in Basra last year, in Kuwait, it was so hot up there. Mm. It started again when I came out this time. What about the tomatoes? Is this a, a new venture? Well, it's a new venture. They just started off, they're doing quite well. I think these, I think they're sunflowers, they've grown so high up the posts. And there's no sign of them flowering. The tomatoes have been in about a month and they're doing very well. Well, yeah. I'll get a crop before I go back, I'm beginning to wonder. Where did you get the soil from? Oh, I came in Bombay. Little men went and fetched it in sacks. They didn't ask where they got it from. <laughs> yes, I should hope not. Yeah. They've been going about three months altogether. I think it's time they had some flowers and we started having some um, end product, I suppose. Mm. Are you proposing I... to branch out into anything else? Not now, no. I thought about growing things. But thought too long and never got any action from it. You could have a complete market garden up here. Could you? you could you do. Really if I came back again, it. yes. Yeah. Courgettes, marrows. You could even grow grapes and do your own, have your own wine press down there, I think. Oh, fine, growing all over the funnel. Now, that, that really would be something, wouldn't it? Yes, I don't know. That'd go down to. <laughs> might support go down too it. Well, in Kuwait, if you're Probably. pressing your own. <laughs> Duarca's passengers sit on the hatch covers with their, newly, with their newly acquired transistors, each tuned to a different station or playing a different cassette. They create a rousing cacophony, a mixture of tastes, eastern and western. <laughs> From Dubai, Dwarka mysteriously acquires her own floating souk. Traders travel as passengers and lay out their wares between decks in order to tap some of the newfound wealth of the returning migrants. There is pressure selling here, but the traders must dispose of their goods before arrival in Pakistan. Rivets come in handy for measuring materials. But buying silk on a ship at sea sailing to India seems rather like taking oil to Kuwait. The gong 
Herald's Dinner on the upper decks. Cabin passengers these days are few and far between, but on this voyage the ship has picked up a number of intrepid Europeans finding an adventurous way to reach India. Together with the returning soldiers and their wives, they eat in style with the captain and the officers. No, because from uh, from um, Muscat to Kuwait, it's very expensive. All the countries in the Gulf are very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> is it the time to say this is from the sunny side of the hill or something like that? <laughs> you don't have the cashmere? Then a little later, after we get to our duty station. I've got to maintain this schedule to keep the opposition out. And there's no reasons for them to continue to stay on when rightfully they should have left. Farm trees and whatnot. Look in this farm, so you take farm this time. <laughs> That's one of the beautiful things about Kashmir. It's a superb stream, something like what I believe is in Scotland. But meanwhile, I had gone to for the service selection board. Schedule is, is the main thing when they can rely on the ship arriving and sailing. They know we're not around to read the down their necks. We're having quite a ball. And mind you, at no stage, India has ever taken a step like that, except probably you might say what happened in the case of Sikkim. Dwarka's Muslim passengers find a vantage point to pray towards Mecca. Pilgrims, as Joseph Conrad called them, of a demanding faith. Dwarka is homeward bound now, crossing the Arabian Sea from Muscat to Karachi. Her passengers carry with them all the booty they have acquired while working in the Gulf. Transistor radios and refrigerators, electric mixers and fans, watches and lighters. Everything in short, including the kitchen sink. They return to troubled countries in the subcontinent, and most I have spoken to wish to return to the Gulf. For Dwarka's crew, a few days rest in Bombay are in prospect before they set sail on their next voyage. They have an affection for the old ship, which is unusual in these days of impersonal container vessels and tankers. But Dwarka is being crowded out. Soon there will be no longer a place for an essentially 19th century vessel in a 19th century trade. Migrants, like travelers everywhere, take the plane. Okay, start three to five. Dwarka threads her way up Karachi's busy anchorage. The ship is now under the command of a pilot from Pakistan. Ship. 
Many of her passengers prepare to disembark here. Porters line up in single file. At one time, they used to rush the ship to secure their customers. But this is General Zia's Pakistan, and the porters conform to military precision. The arrival of a passenger ship is a rare event. They too want to share some of the migrants' cash. But there is little military precision about the disembarkation. For the passengers, a number of hurdles remain before their adventure is over. Their possessions have to be safely gathered together from the decks and holds of the ship. The customs line wait for their cut. Further long journeys have to be made by train to the far north and northwest of the country. They return to a country much changed. In two years, a great deal has happened. There are new rulers and new laws, some of which have brought Pakistan closer to the states of the Middle East. For the labor migrants, working abroad has been a stopgap measure, an attempt to get rich quick, which for many will have failed. They must now try to resume their lives, find new jobs where few are available. The Pakistan government shows no signs of blocking the migrant trail, for that would make problems at home even greater. The treasures the emigrants have brought back may have to last them a long time. She is still cheaper than the plane, and she provides the opportunity to carry new possessions home. For some, the voyage has been the most memorable part of the experience. But the finances of passenger shipping are balanced on a knife edge, and ships like Dwarka can never be replaced. As we arrive in Bombay, her sister ship, Dumra, which formerly shared the route with her, is towed off to the breaker's yard. That, today, seems to be the destination of all working passenger ships. The construction boom in the Gulf is over, so not even the labor migrant trade can keep the ships alive much longer. When Dwarka disappears, an era in shipping history will come to an end, and with it, the last British passenger service of India. You might like to know that the Dwarka stayed in service for four years after this film was made. In May 1983, she was finally beached and broken up.